Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago, which is in Exodus chapter 8. Uh, it's interesting how much text God gives to each of the different plagues. And the plague of frogs gets some of the largest coverage of any of the plagues as we go through the ten different plagues that God sent on the land of Egypt. And I hope you picked up some of the humor uh, of that plague as we were reading it just a few moments ago. Uh, God spent some time with the plague of the frogs and where he sent the frogs and how everybody was affected by the frogs and in some very interesting ways I hope as you noticed. Now of course the last time we were together we saw the first plague which was the plague of blood and I'm going to read just a few verses out of that to emphasize certain things because the plague of frogs is very closely connected with the plague of blood. You'll see that I think as I read a few of the verses uh, out of chapter 7, the last half of chapter 7, you'll see some of the connections because remember snakes eat frogs and frogs come from the river and so we've had a, a snake miracle which was the casting down of Moses rod. We've had the miracle of the river and all the water, fresh water in Egypt, including in the vessels of wood and of stone, turning to blood. And now we're going to have a, a very interesting plague of frogs. And I'm just going to read a couple of these verses out of here. God has told Moses to go stand next to the river uh, and then uh, have the rod in his hand. And then it says, the waters which are in the river, they shall be turned to blood. Verse 18, it says, and the river shall stink. Now, you probably noticed as we read through about the frogs, <laughs> God didn't just make the frogs go back into the river. God killed the frogs. Pharaoh said, get rid of the frogs. He didn't say how to get rid of the frogs. <laughs> God said, okay, I'll do it my way. I'm not just going to send them back to the river. They're going to die everywhere, and you're going to have to gather them together. And there were piles and piles of frogs. And it says, and the land stank. Do you think God was making a point? How do you think Egypt smelled in the nostrils of God? God is telling the Egyptians, folks, you stink as far as I am concerned. He gave them dead fish that stank. He gave them a river that turned to blood, and as you know, when blood coagulates and begins to decay, it stinks. How many of you ever had rotting meat in your freezer that went out? I have. I had a freezer go out. I lost nearly a thousand dollars worth of meat. It was loaded with meat, and I didn't know that it had gone out. And I opened the door one day, and the most horrible smell came out of that. And there had been a bunch of packages of chicken breasts in there, and all the blood had curdled and just gotten really ugly. And man, did that smell bad! Can you imagine a river over four thousand miles long? beginning to stink. That's what happened. God was telling them something by that. The river shall stink. It says that the Egyptians were loath to drink of the water of the river. <laughs> I guess so. You know, it's rather interesting because we looked last time that we were together, which actually the last time was in February. Can you believe that? February 22nd was when I preached on this. Then we had March uh, uh, 1st and then March 15th. Uh, yeah, 7th, 8th, and then uh, 15th. So um, here we have again drinking death. We saw a connection with the book of Revelation. How God gives them blood to drink. He did that here. We're going to see a connection today with the frogs too and the book of Revelation. Did you know that the book of Revelation talks about the frogs? Some final judgments that God is going to do in the book of Revelation parallel some of the judgments that we see over here in the book of Exodus. We'll get to that, the Lord willing, in a little bit. And it says, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone, that's all the fresh water, not merely that which was connected to the river, which proved that this was a clear miracle, not just a natural occurrence, like some of the liberals have suggested, of a red mudslide upstream that made the water look like it was blood. It was in the vessels of wood and of stone that it also turned to blood. 
Then we get down to verse 22. It says, And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And as we noted, they did that with the frogs too. And neither of those is very helpful miracles that the magicians did. I mean, Pharaoh wanted to get rid of frogs. And so what did the magicians do? They produced more frogs. <laughs> Not very clever. But you know, the devil's magic and his supernatural powers are never, never beneficial to his people in the long run. They're impressive. He does have supernatural power, and we talked about that before. He is capable of doing supernatural acts, but never beneficial to his people. Always damaging. Always that which destroys. The devil doesn't give life. The devil has come to kill and to maim and to destroy. Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And so the rivers of Egypt were blood for seven days, not just overnight while the water cleared itself of its mud. And then we looked at, last week, we looked at the fruit inspectors, or two weeks ago, the fruit inspectors. The first part of it sure doesn't taste like cranberry juice. That was the blood. Moses could not see Pharaoh's heart. He could only see his external response. It was obvious externally that Pharaoh had hardened his heart. But God confirmed it to Moses, what Moses could already see, which gave us a very important lesson that we find Christ reemphasizing in the New Testament, is the real truth will always be confirmed by the Word of God. And the Bible gives us the responsibility of being fruit inspectors. Sinning Christians hate the idea of fruit inspectors, and they always hit you with that quote, judge not lest you be judged. But they fail to read what is said in the next verse. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 1, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye meet, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, ye shall, it shall be measured to you again. Jesus wasn't saying that we can never judge, but that you must not be a hypocrite when you judge. In fact, there are specific cases we looked at in the New Testament where we have to judge for the sake of the purity of the church. We looked at 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13, where a Christian man, and it's a Christian man from context. If you read it carefully, it's a Christian man who's committing incest. He had to be turned over to the devil to destroy his flesh that his spirit might be saved. Paul clearly stated that he had judged already. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 5. And Paul commanded the church corporately and individually to do four things. One, to judge the man. Number two, to deliver him unto Satan. Number three, to break fellowship with him. And number four, to excommunicate him. Paul further stated that that process applies not only to people in incestuous relationships, but it also applies to any Christian in the following categories, as well as many others mentioned in the New Testament. There's only one place where he talks about church discipline. But listen to the next verse here in 1 Corinthians 5. But now have I written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother. We're talking about Christians. Be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not you judge them that are within. But them that are without, God judgeth. That is, those who are not believers. Therefore put away from among yourselves, there's the excommunication, that wicked person. We saw that fruit in the Bible often refers to the visible manifestations of what is in the heart of man. Moses could see the fruit that was in Pharaoh's responses, but God confirmed what was in Pharaoh's heart with the word of God. That's the practical application. God does that for us as well. We can examine the fruit of a person's life and lips and compare it with the word of God to see what is in that person's heart. Most Christians don't realize how big the issue of lifestyle fruit is in the Bible. And we looked at dozens of verses on that. Not going over them all again, but just giving a quick summary so it ties us in with what we're doing today. Dozens of verses in the Bible we looked at a number of Old Testament illustrations, many uses of the term fruit by our Lord Jesus Christ, of the type of fruit that we're supposed to examine, at the type of fruit that we're supposed to be bearing, the type of fruit that we're supposed to be avoiding. We saw in John 15 there are four stages of fruit bearing in the Christian life. We saw Jesus talking about bearing fruit, number one. Number two, bearing more fruit. Number three, bearing much fruit. Number four, bearing abiding fruit. Some bear more fruit than others, but all who are saved will bear fruit. Matthew 13, 8, But some fell on, unto good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some 
thirtyfold. And then verse 23 he says, But he that received seed into the good ground, now listen carefully, is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundred fold, some sixty, and some thirty. Did you hear what the key was? I mean, I only read you two verses out of that very extended passage where Jesus talks about the, the different types of soil that the sower sows his seed onto. But did you hear the keys? I think it's clear that fruit bearing is welded inseparably to the intake and the flourishing of the Word of God in our hearts as the Holy Spirit causes spiritual growth in the life of the believer. We have to hear it. That was the first thing. He that heareth the word. Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Paul didn't make that up. He's getting that from what Jesus said here in Matthew 13. That's the very first thing that Jesus says about how fruit will be produced in the life of the Christian. It says, he that heareth the word. And then he has to receive the word. He has to understand it. He has to believe it. By the way, all the verbs that are used in all the different places uh, in the three Gospels where this parable is given, different words are used in connection with that. Every one of them relates to the work of the Holy Spirit. Every one of those verbs, you will find it being used of the Holy Spirit working in the heart of the believer to produce the fruit. And then number three is to bring forth fruit. Mark chapter 4, verse 20, for example. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it. Now remember, understand was the word that was used by Matthew. And bring forth fruit. Some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. And so we summarize that for you all with that little question that I like to ask when people claim to be Christians. So you say you're a Christian. How has it changed your life? You say you're a Christian. So how has it changed your life? You've heard me say it before. God takes you as you are, but God does not leave you as you are. When God saves you, he regenerates you. He gives you new life. The new life is going to grow it's going to bring forth fruit because the Holy Spirit is at work in your life to convict you of sin, to bring you to repentance, to chasten you when you refuse to repent, to prune you so that what is produced is not garbage, but what is produced is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. God works in the life of the Christian. God doesn't just simply save you and say, well, I'll see you later when you get to heaven. God is actively working in the life of every believer to transform us into the image of Christ. That is his goal, to cause us to grow, to bear fruit, to be a testimony. And the Christian who refuses to do so is like a ball player on the football field who keeps taking the ball and running it over the opponent's goal line. The coach is going to jerk him off the field. You don't want that to happen to you. There are going to be tears in heaven. It says so in the book of Revelation. Our works are going to be tried by fire, and the fire will test every man's work of what sort it is. Either it's going to be gold, silver, precious stones, or it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. And as the fire burns out there, the wood, hay, and stubble is going to go kafoo. The gold, silver, and precious stones are going to remain. The things done to the glory of God in the power of the Holy Spirit, in obedience to the Word of God. That's the test, the three different tests, by the way, for good works in the New Testament. Things that are not done in the flesh, not done for the glory of man, but things that are done in obedience to the word of God, to the glory of God, in the power of the spirit of God. Those are the things that are good works. Oh, I wish we had time to talk about that. Fruit. How has it changed your life? What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed for the end of those things is death? Romans 6.21 Now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. There are different kinds of fruit. What's showing up in your life? I just quoted you Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 9 talks about that fruit also. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. 
Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God. Hebrews 12.11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Here's the coach disciplining. Here's the, the gardener pruning. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, why does God do it? Here's the reason. Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Part of that is what we say. Part of that is what we do. Listen to 13, 15 in Hebrews. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You see, fruit extends to every area of the life. It includes our works. It includes our speech. It includes our thoughts. It includes our motives. It includes the way in which we react and emotionally react to what other people say and do to us. Fruit is something that will permeate the life of of a living vine as it extends out in every manifestation of that vine. We're branches off the vine. And so the life of Jesus is flowing through us if you're a Christian. And it flows out through our branch and it comes out in terms of fruit in every area of our lives. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. James chapter 3, verse 17. And then verse 18 talks about it again. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. What do you have inside an apple? You have seeds, don't you? And so it's talking about the fruit being sown. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. As the old saying goes, any fool can count the number of seeds in an apple, but only God can count the number of, number of apples in a seed. Are you sowing through the fruit that you're bearing? Is it not only producing fruit in your life that you feel is beneficial to you and glorifies God, and after all, other people can see the fruit and it's hanging there, and you know, you can polish it and make it look real shiny, or are you planting it so that it goes out to others? But there's others who have no fruit. Jude 1.12, these are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you. Feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Now, I know I covered a lot of that stuff before, but I wanted to say it again because it's very important. And listen carefully. Because what I'm about to say, I'm not saying just for the sake of our young people, though we have a good number of them. I'm saying it also for the adults and the old people and for myself as well. If there is no spiritual fruit in your life, if there is no spiritual fruit in your life, remember we've been talking about fruit inspectors. That's part of one of the lessons that we learned here as we're studying the plagues. If there's no fruit in your life, it means that you are not saved. Because some produces 30-fold, some produces 60-fold, some produces 100-fold. There's a difference in the amount. There's a difference in the timing. But if you claim to have been saved for 25 or 30 years and you've never had any fruit in your life, you know what it says? It says you're not saved. That is a very serious issue. It means that we need to examine ourselves very carefully before it's too late. Some Christians produce more than others. Some produce more quickly than others. But all Christians will bear spiritual fruit because Jesus said so. And because the sovereign, supernatural Holy Spirit is the one who causes it to happen in the life of those who are true believers. It's not because you've got to work harder at it. You don't have to work harder at bearing fruit. It's because the life of Jesus is flowing through you and it flows through your branch and it flows out and doesn't just produce leaves. There is fruit that shows up. If you have no fruit, you're probably a phony Christian. Paul said so. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. 
We are called upon to make examination. Others can examine, and very easily, as to what they really see, whether or not it's a phony veneer, or whether there is actually the living Christ flowing by His Spirit through us and producing genuine fruit and not plastic bananas on the end of an oak tree. Examine yourselves. That's why we give such serious exhortation every time we serve the Lord's table, which, by the way, is coming up again in two weeks. I hope you're prepared for that. We are to examine ourselves. Paul says so. 1 Corinthians 11, 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, he hasn't examined himself, doesn't know what's there and what's not there, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Do you know what? It can make you sick. You take the Lord's table, and you take it unworthily, it can make you not only sick, but it can kill you. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Remember back to the fruit-bearing stuff, fruit examiners, fruit inspectors. Don't judge me, because the Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. Whoa, he says, we're supposed to judge here. In fact, it's so serious that it could cause you to die if you don't. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Let me say a balancing thing to that. If you are saved and not living in sin, now if you're not saved, don't take the Lord's table. If you're saved and living in sin, don't take the Lord's table. But if you are saved and if you are not living in sin, you should be taking the Lord's table because he commanded it. He didn't say, you know, if you think about it, you might want to do it every now and then, sort of if you get around to it and if you don't have something better to do. Or if you're, you know, not just sort of being stubborn on the day that the Lord's table is being served, well, you know, you're welcome to it. He didn't say that. He gave a command. This do in remembrance of me. If you don't know for sure that you're saved, Please talk to me after the service. Oh, dear people. I've been in churches where people refuse to take the Lord's table because they say, well, you know, I just want to make sure that if, if I'm not really saved, I, I don't want to, you know, get in trouble. An idiot position. You need to trust Christ and be saved. Or they say, well, you know, I might have some sin in my life, or I know I have some sin and I don't want to give it up, so I'm not going to take the Lord's table. Idiot position! Confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Keep a short account with God. Confess your sin. Repent if there's some habitual sin that you keep going back into. Repentance means not only confessing it and then go back and do it. Repentance means you confess it and you turn from it. 180 degrees, the other direction. You can't do that in your own power. Only the Spirit of God can do that. Only the Spirit of God can break the habits that are in your life. Only the Spirit of God can stop the, the sullen rebellion that keeps sticking its head up like an ugly snake. But He can crush it. He can change your life. Do you have something you need to repent of? Something that you know is hidden there in the dark that you think nobody else knows, but God knows it. And so you don't take the Lord's table because you know that stuff is in your life. And uh, after all, you don't want to get sick. You don't want God to judge you and, and chasten you and maybe pull you off the playing field. Dear friend, the, the right response is confess it. Repent from your sin. And then join in the fellowship, the blessed beautiful fellowship of the Lord's table. Some of you don't know for sure whether you're saved and going to heaven. As your pastor, it's my desire to help you know for sure. We can know for sure, the Bible says so. We can know for sure that we're saved. We can know for sure that we're going to heaven. We can have eternal security. <laughs> we can know and if you don't know, please talk to me afterwards. 
Because to really have assurance of your salvation so that you can come to the Lord's table with clean hands and a pure heart in full assurance. The scripture talks about the full assurance that we have. But to do that, you have to examine yourselves for fruit so that you won't be called reprobate by the Lord. Interesting, that's the way it's phrased even in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 6.30. Here's what God says. Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Paul writes to Titus about those who are reprobate those who have an outward profession, those who are pretending to be Christians, those who go through the motions, those who attend church on Sunday, those who show up at the potluck dinners, uh, those who maybe even go on mission trips. But it says they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Back to fruit inspectors. Back to looking at what is in the life of the individual. Being abominable, and disobedient and unto every good work remember the three tests for a good work it's not help, helping a little old lady across the sink or fixing your neighbor's uh, street or fixing your neighbor's sink when it's uh, leaking the test for good works obedience to the Word of God to the glory of God in the power of the Spirit of God if you're missing any one of those three tests it's not a good work as far as God is concerned you did it for your own glory, it's not a good work. You did it in the power of the flesh, it's not a good work. You did it contrary to what you know the Bible teaches, it's not a good work. Even if it's very nice, and even if the public would applaud you for it. Three tests for good works. It says they are abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. I can't believe that our time has gone so well. Well, anyway, let me let me just summarize quickly what we learned from that first plague, why it was blood. Of course, it's one of the gods of Egypt, the Nile River. God is the only one who can give life, not the Nile who gives life. God pointed back to himself as the creator of, and the ultimate and only source of life. Through that, that was the first thing we saw. We saw the first plague has practical application for us today because... Life did not spontaneously arise in a primordial soup of chemicals composed of hydrogen and oxygen, as posited by the evolutionists. The very first plague was designed to establish that God is the creator of life. It goes back to his glorious creator first before moving on. Sunday evenings we've been talking about Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. And Paul starts with God the creator, the one who gives life. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Second, we saw the second reason was closely related to the first reason. God specifically stated that the location in which he put the life was in the blood. He turned the river to blood. He turned all the water to blood. Leviticus 17.11, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And we said many, many things about that and how God would cut him, cut off the people who drank the blood and for the life of the flesh is in the blood, verse 11. Uh, no soul of you shall eat blood, verse 12. Verse 13, he shall pour out the blood thereof and cover with dust. Verse 14, for it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is the life thereof. For the life of the flesh is in the blood thereof. It was a capital crime punishable by death to drink the blood because God gave it as a source of life. He was teaching us something. That's why blood was the first plague. God is the God of life, not the God of death. We saw that it also is a picture of something else that angers God, a hardened heart. Proverbs 14.30, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but the envy is the rottenness of the bone. We saw the third reason that blood was used as the first plague. There must be blood for an atonement. We saw blood as the vessel of life is required to make atonement for sin. In fact, that's carried over into the New Testament. If you look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 25, blood is mentioned 11 times. You know, years ago there was a preacher by the name of Bob Thiem at Bracket Church in Houston, Texas, right at Dallas Seminary. And he had some very, very strange ideas. And he made the statement at one point that the blood is not what's important. It's no more valuable than water. It's just a symbol. Do you understand we have redemption through his blood, we have sanctification through his blood, we have salvation through his blood, we have propitiation through his blood, we have remission through his blood, we have reconciliation through his blood. If you look at the New Testament, it doesn't say through his spiritual life. It says through his blood. 
without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no sending away of sin. Blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's why blood was the first plague. Further, the blood sacrifice had to be offered by a qualified priest. We saw that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Not a pagan priest, not a magician. The magicians turned water to blood. Very unhelpful trying to impress Pharaoh. Pharaoh needed water to drink, not more blood. Further, we notice that the water was stored in the vessels throughout the land of Egypt. It was a supernatural event, not just a natural event. The Egyptians tried to dig water out of the ground. Fourth, we saw that the plague of blood is a portent of future judgment on the world. We noted the book of Revelation talks about blood 17 different times. We saw that the judgments of Revelation are divided into the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls. God gives the earth increasing judgments of blood as we move from seals to trumpets to bowls. He opened the sixth seal. The moon became his blood. The first angel sounded, that's a trumpet judgment. Hail and fire mingled with blood. We find the second angel sounded. It was a great mountain burning with fire cast into the sea. The third part of the sea became blood. We saw the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, in Revelation 11, verses six, uh, verse 6. It says, they have power over the waters to turn them to blood. I mean, I wish we had time to talk about why I believe that's Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses there, but uh, just looking at the miracles that they do, it takes you back to the plagues of Egypt. It takes you back to the miracles of Elijah. Revelation 16, verses 3 through 6. The second angel poured out his bowl upon the sea. That's the salt water. It became as blood of a dead man. That's coagulated and stinking, just like he had in Egypt. Every living soul died in the sea. Verse 4. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, the fresh water. They became blood. Verse 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and martyrs. Thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. You know why God chose blood for the first plague? And then we closed with the thought, very sobering thought, because there's a lot of denial of the book of Revelation today, that just like in the days of Moses, God gave them blood to drink. If you allegorize Revelation, you also have to allegorize the plagues of Egypt. And that brings us to the fresh frog blood, and we have five minutes. We'll cover as much as we can. Notice where the frogs came from. They came from the river. In other words, this plague is closely connected with the previous plague. Now, you know there are other things in the river. But we don't have a plague of crocodiles. <laughs> That's been exciting. <laughs> but we don't have a plague of crocodiles. We don't have a, a plague of hippopotamuses. We don't have a plague of river birds. We don't have a plague of river snakes. Though God could have done that if he wanted. And it would have been much scarier, don't you think? Suppose suddenly, instead of frogs hopping up on the land, here come millions of crocodiles. <laughs> Or out of the water, lumber the hippos with these gaping wide mouths. Kawump, kawump, kawump. Do you think that would have terrified the Egyptians? I think that would have terrified the Egyptians. If God wanted to terrify the Egyptians with the second plague, he could have chosen something else. How about birds? Some of you may remember, now this dates my age, I know, but how many of you remember Alfred Hitchcock's thriller, The Birds? Okay. Well, some of you are older than I thought you were. <laughs> it was black and white. That was back in the days before they had color films. But anyway, the birds, or he starts off by giving you some scientific facts about how many millions and billions of birds are all over the planet, and then these birds start attacking people and coming down chimneys. And The birds. God could have made a plague of birds. He didn't do the plague of birds, did he? If God was merely wanting to scare people, he could have done it in different ways. Having crocodiles invade every home in Egypt, more people are killed and maimed by hippos every year than by sharks. Hippos are a very dangerous animal. Snakes could have gotten into every place in the land. But God sent frogs. Look where they landed. The river shall bring forth frogs abundantly. They shall go up and come into thine house. In other words, Pharaoh wasn't exempt from this plague. Pharaoh had frogs in his house. That's why Pharaoh gets irritated at the end and says, get rid of the frogs. I'm tired of stepping on the frog. Oh, no, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. You know, every place he moved, he reached down to pick up something, he gets a frog instead of picking it up. Frogs, frogs, frogs everywhere. They shall go up and come into thine house and into thy bedchamber. Pharaoh rolls over and says, well, good night, sweetheart. Here's 
ribbit, ribbit, or needy, needy, some little frog, you know. <laughs> what did you say? Ribbit. And upon thy bed. Pharaoh lies down in bed and hears something goes, <laughs> what's this under me, you know? Get rid of the frogs. And into the house of thy servants. You know, that's a good way to have your servants worn out very, very quickly if they spend their entire time trying to burst their frogs out of the way. Not getting anything else done. And upon thy people. Guy sits down, thinks, man, I'm going to take a break. And onto him immediately jump 200 frogs. Bouncing around on top of him. It says, upon thy people. And into thy ovens. I think, man, I need to cook something for dinner. I open the oven and I'll jump a bunch of frogs. Or maybe they don't jump out. Maybe they got frog legs for dinner. And into thy kneading troughs. Can you imagine that? That's why the message is entitled Fresh Frog Bread. <laughs> um, at, at the Presbytery, final meal that we had, no, they didn't all serve uh, frog legs, but at that final meal that we had, we ate at a restaurant, and they did serve frog legs if you wanted them at that meal. You know, frogs in your bread. Now, I mean, there's pumpkin bread, and there's zucchini bread, and there's raisin bread, and there is... Um, you know, nut bread and all kinds of really nice breads. Can you imagine cutting into your bread and you've got half a frog in your slice? Folks, do you understand this was a real irritation <laughs> to the people of Egypt? This wasn't a scary miracle. This was an obnoxious miracle. This was something that God was saying, so you think you're so cool, huh? So you like frogs? I'm going to give you some frogs. It's one of their gods. You like frogs. Oh boy, you can have a treat today. Frogs everywhere. And so Pharaoh cried out to God and he said or to Moses and he says, you know, please get rid of the frogs for me. Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice to the Lord. You know, we are often motivated to do or not to do certain things by the things that irritate us. Now, the first miracle was a life and death kind of a miracle. River turned into blood. You can't live very long without water. The second miracle teaches us something about ourselves as human beings. It's an irritation. And Pharaoh gets fed up with it. And he says, beg God to get rid of the frogs. Moses says, okay. i tell you what. You tell me when you want God to get rid of the frogs. And Pharaoh thinks for a minute, i got to time this thing exactly right so I can see if it's a miracle. You know, because, I mean, if the frogs just sort of like disappear, okay, that's, that's one thing. But I'm going to time it. So Pharaoh says, tomorrow. Moses says, you want it tomorrow? It'll be tomorrow. But heh heh, you didn't tell me how God was going to get rid of the frogs. Heh heh. <laughs> God didn't send the frogs back to the river. God didn't make the frogs vanish. God didn't have all the frogs taken up suddenly in an alien invasion, you know, spaceship hovering over and wanting frog dinners, and so they sucked up all the frogs of Egypt into their spaceship and disappeared into the, you know, outer space. God killed the frogs. And you got dead frogs everywhere all over the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord, Lord did according to the word of the Lord of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields, and they gathered them together upon heaps. Now, folks, if the entire land of Egypt had heaps, huge stacks of frogs, how many billions of frogs do you think there were in the land of Egypt? That's supernatural. Frogs obviously would have left the river because of blood, but I mean, you got more frogs than normally would be dwelling in the river. They're in heaps all over the land of Egypt. And the land stink. But you know, just like with our irritations, sometimes we make a decision based on the irritation, but then when the irritation goes away, we go right back to the way we were before, don't we? Do we? Yeah, we do. And that's what happened here. Pharaoh hardened his heart. You like frogs? I'll give you frogs, says God. But you know, the frogs weren't poisonous. There are some frogs in South America that are poisonous. They make poison darts out of them. But I think that most importantly here, and we'll be closing with this,
Archie, go ahead. Frogs, this is very interesting. Frogs are found in statues of demon gods in Mexico, in South America, in China, in Africa, and within those continents in almost every different culture in the com uh, continent. There are carvings of frogs, some with fangs, frogs, some with wings, frogs, some which required human sacrifice, frogs. Do you know what we find that in the book of Revelation also? Let me read it to you. We're in Revelation chapter 16 starting in verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. We're talking about the battle of Armageddon here. Which demons are it that are going to be coming out and gathering the kings of the earth? What is their appearance when they are shown visibly? They look like frogs. Do you wonder why the second plague is the plague of the frogs? And why no matter how many frogs there were, when God decided, he killed them all at once and the land stank. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne, saying, It is done! And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. Interesting like the three frogs. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. We've already seen Revelation 16, which is the bowl judgments, how three times men realize that it's God who's sending the judgments, and rather than repent, they blaspheme the name of the God of heaven. Do you think that's a hard heart? Do you think it might reflect Pharaoh's heart? God killed the frogs and Pharaoh hardened his heart. There are no accidents in the Bible, folks. When you begin to study the Old Testament and the New Testament together, you discover that the New Testament reveals and uncovers what the Old Testament was talking about. Paul tells us that God gave us those things for examples and to teach us upon whom the ends of the world are come. So you like fresh frog bread. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for its power. We thank you that the scripture interweaves so beautifully, produces an incredible tapestry showing the sovereign workings of God, the, the wonderful mind of God, the judgments of God, the mercy and grace of God. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He shed his blood. He has overcome all the demons and the darkness and devil himself, all that would stand against him in this world and has provided for us an eternal salvation, a sure salvation. We can know for sure that we're saved because Jesus Christ said so and the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and lives to transform us into the image of Christ. Father, we thank you that our faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Not merely saving faith, but the faith for daily growth. The walk of faith, walking in the Spirit, in obedience to the word of God, understanding the word of God, receiving it, believing it, the different verbs that we saw as Jesus spoke of the fruit in the life of the believer. We pray, Father, that you will take your word as expounded today, that you will challenge us that you will motivate us, that you will get us out of our lethargy, out of our slothful, sluggish sleep, that you become, cause us to become zealous for Jesus Christ, 
who will be unashamed of his testimony. The Father, we would not love our lives even unto the death, but if you call us to die for the sake of Christ, that we be filled with your spirit and with courage, courageousness to be able to stand against all that comes against us and say, for Jesus I live and for Jesus I die. Help us, Father. We are your people. We can do nothing without you. Convict us of sin that's in our life. Bring us to not only confession, but to repentance. Help us as we look forward to the Lord's table in a couple of weeks to really be ready for it. And then to partake with joy and gladness. Because we know, based on your word, that we're saved. And we have assurance of that salvation. And we have confessed and repented of the sin that's in our life so that we can come with clean hands and a clean heart. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 597, very much in keeping with what we've studied today. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. And